yeah so we are looking at uh, let's start with Doof's maximal inequality which measure which gives you an estimate on probability that the maximum of the sub martingale exceeds lambda an interesting thing is that the uh, index of time over which we are taking the maximum doesn't enter the picture only the terminal value mn enters the picture and uh, that is a major result and uh, can be we will see its utilization in a, a short while okay so uh, and the the key parts needed for this are basically the definition of martingale definition of a stopping time and the Duke's uh, martingale transform theorem that we did that uh, if you have a martingale by transforming it via uh, predictable multipliers you can only remain martingale and if sub martingale will remain only a sub martingale as long as the multipliers are non negative okay so um, now uh, now I come to another very interesting uh, inequality. To begin with, we are just going to talk about a sequence of real numbers. And uh, you all have studied, and you of us may have taught also about uh, you have a sequence of real numbers. How, how do we show that it converges to a value? And one of our favorite things could be maybe lim soup and lim inf. And when lim soup equal to lim inf, then yes, it is equal to the uh, uh, the limit exists and equal to the lim soup lim inf, right? Now. Here is a completely different take on. Uh, my typos. This is less than equal to. So suppose you have a sequence of number x k one less than equal to k less than equal to n, and a less than b are real numbers. So I am continuing continuing to follow up where I am using little uh, 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 little x for a value and capital X for a random variable. So these are real numbers and a and b are a less than b is a real number. Let s, j and t, j be defined as follows. So these are going to be in integers, positive integers, non-negative integers. p0 is 0 and for 1 less than equal to j less than equal to n, we define s, j to be first k above tj minus 1 so k has to be bigger than equal to j minus 1 and first k after tj minus 1 such that xk is less than n so k is such that tj minus 1 less than equal to k less than equal to n and tk is less than n okay so first k after that time where it is less than a and then Tj is the uh, first k after that where it is bigger than b. So uh, here is a graph. Pictorially, we catch, uh, catch it much earlier. So, 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 so these are the points s1, s2, x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. So the first time you go below a is this point. After that, first time you go above B is this point. After this first time you go below A is this point. First time you go above B after that is this one. First time you go below A is this. Now here you continue to be below A but you don't separately mark it. Okay. And next is this. So, This is our one point. This is S1. This is T1. This is S2. This will be T2. This will be S3. This will be T3. This will be S4. And end point will be T4. And after that, all of them will be just that end point. So, you start anywhere, first time you go below A, you mark it as S1. After that, first time, after that, first time you go above B, you mark it as T1. 
After that first time you go below A, you mark it as S2. After that first time you go above B is this and so on. And algebraically we have defined and if u n is the largest j such that s j minus 1 is less than a and p j minus s t j is bigger than b. So, uh, each of this is called a up crossing. Uh, the, the, the connecting dots, connecting dots is not the up crossing, but the other one which is uh, uh, this is an up crossing s1 to t1 is up crossing s2 to t2 is up crossing s3 to t3 is up crossing here a uh, crossing has begun but has not ended because you have not actually crossed so un is the number of completed up crossings so there will be three okay so mm, mm, you say that you have an up crossing if you start somewhere where it is you are below and then you go above B. That is an up crossing. Next up crossing you will start next time you go below A and so on. And UN is the total number of up crossings up to time N. And uh, clearly uh, for a convergent sequence, uh, number of up crossings have to be finite for any A strictly less than B. You can say that the sequence is converging in real numbers if and only if number of up crossings of AB, UN AB limit over N, UN AB is finite for every A less than B. Trivial to write this as a statement and to prove the statement, almost trivial. What is interesting is that His voice is getting cut. You end it with a positive sign. So, in up crossing, you take the upper point minus the lower point of that up crossing. Over. So, this is the summation of up cross. Uh, this is the summation of x's. But we are selectively choosing which one to add and which one not to add. Okay. And then of equal to number of up crossings times B minus A. But there can be the last one can be an unfinished up crossing. So we have to account for that and then a little bit of this we can tell us that it might A minus A. If it is below A, then the endpoint minus A. So the right now in this example, X n minus A is this is X n A. X n minus A is this, but actually the unfinished up crossing is actually this X n minus this point. So the unfinished one will only be a negative line will be only less than X n minus A minus. So this sheet itself, this screen itself is telling us a whole lot of information as to uh, what is involved. Okay. So, once again, you have a sequence A and X n, then you take a A less than B and then you, you think about it as follows. Suppose this X n are some prices of some shares or prices something which are constantly fluctuating. Okay. So, you buy some, you, 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 you are sitting with a pot of money, you don't do anything. As soon as the price goes below A, you buy. After that, whether it goes down or goes up, you don't, you sit doing nothing till if it goes above B, you sell. How much money you have made? This minus this. Continue to follow this. Okay. The total money you would win will be this plus this plus this. But last one, you have put in some money which is still unfinished, which may not gone above B. So, what is the maximum that you can go down? That is this value listed here. So, the left hand side is the, the summation of uh, overall things, your net gain from your strategy. It can be negative, but your net gain from the strategy. 
and it is bounded above n times the b minus a and then this one last bit but really speaking this has nothing to do with probability this is something which is simply a thing with analysis that the sequence is convergent to a real number in, in r if and only if number of up crossings u n a b limit over n is finite for every a less than b now naturally we do don't do it in analysis because where will you use it anybody can write a theorem but it's useful i mean it will be noted by others only when you use it and we'll see that in analysis this may have no use but in probability it has immense use and we will we'll be using that now so i put in this uh, i what i described the strategy that you know if you are bit, it is one if you are about uh, you have up crossing is continuing but has not yet ended uh, you put it as one and zero otherwise and the gain will be this so this also observation i already made that you have a bounded sequence converges if and only if supremum over n u n a b is finite for all a less than b now so this was deterministic now let us come to a uh, super martingale mk okay. let us so now i as i said i am using capital letters when these are random variables and now little s and little t i have changed it to sigma tau and sigma j and tau j and we use the same definitions you so one of them is a start time one of them is a stop time but we just the, the name we initially started with stopping so therefore it continues to get the name stopping time but it can be used to start or to stop so sigma is a starting time tau is a stopping time you start uh, investing if you are uh, after sigma j and when you reach tau j you stop and continue to do that and un is a total number such that this happens and then uh, we have the inequality that your net gain from this strategy which is summation of this uh and as we had already written down fk the sum the net gain summation this is exactly summation fk m1 m2 m m1 m2 mk minus 1 mk minus mk minus 1 and that will be greater than equal to this quantity now since we have argued that uh mk is a super martingale since our assumption was that mk is a super martingale it follows that the uh, expected value of this object is negative and if expected is negative but this whole thing is positive that means this quantity is also negative expected value of this quantity is also negative and from there by taking expectations we'll get that expected up crossings expected number of up crossings is less than equal to expected number of this quantity mn minus a minus b minus a so uh, something which we had already noted that the, we can't guarantee that the strategy will give you positive returns but the net gain of this thing can only be will be all positive terms at best at worst you will be only the last end point is where your analysis may be or your strategy may be giving you a bad result and that is what is captured in this uh, estimate here that the expected value of uh, up crossings is less than equal to uh, expected value of mn minus a minus b minus a and what we just now did is proving the third major lemma by do that we Uh, up crossing uh, lemma if this super martingale if a is less than b uh, this denotes the number of up crossings of the interval then one has expected un is less than equal to expected b bn minus a minus b minus a and this itself can be changed to an uh, upper bound will be absolute value of mn plus absolute value of a divided by b minus a so we have dubs up crossings lemma or dubs up crossings theorem so maximal inequality and the up crossings lemma or up crossings theorem uh, and the uh, 
martingale transform these three major results on martingales all due to do and perhaps all in a era of about 10 years in the 1950s that do uh, made these things popular and wrote his first book uh, wrote his book called stochastic processes difficult to read now because of just the notations and terminology used there but it's a gem of a book and uh, <clears throat> this set the tone for uh, happenings and uh, research in probability theory for decades to come okay so uh, to sum up at this point uh, the three major results that we talked about are uh, uh, three major results we talked are uh, the <coughs> definition of martingales and stop times then the martingale transforms the maximal inequality and the upcrossing inequality or upcrossing lemma upcrossing theorem okay and uh, the three together are uh, extremely powerful tools uh, and at least uh, one application of these to give you a some major result i'm going to do uh, uh, the, the, the entire probability theory is uh, full of applications of this i may just add that uh, uh in my msc final year or mstat final year 1977 1978 era so it's already 45 years ago uh professor bhira taught us martingales in my final year and uh, uh during that uh while he was teaching us uh, we had a, a, a big time probabilist called navu from you uh, from france visiting Yes, and there was going to be a research seminar, and Professor Bivira told us that there were only two of us in our class. He told us that you have enough background to attend uh, the research seminar, and so the first seminar I ever attended as a student, uh, while still a master student, was uh, a lecture by uh, Jacques Navu, and the result was that the talk was about on a proof of ergodic theorem in maths using martingale technique. So of course it is not as simple as the uh, Weierstrass inequality, which I could write down in only on one slide. The proof, uh, the proof is li a little more complicated. So I have of course not included here, but just to outline to you that and, and the basic tools for the three results that we've done now. Now these three can be used in any different ways and get hold of the uh, <coughs> uh, uh, ergodic theorem. Okay. So, which is we can say a measure theoretic thing. In measure theory, strictly speaking, it's nothing to do with probability. It's a theorem about transformations and ergodic transformations. What are defined to be all right. So, uh, <clears throat> next, what I am going to do is to show the power of these three tools that we did. Okay. Only thing is that to get the full power. we have to go beyond uh, our countable framework that uh, the omega itself the, the number of uh, things is only finite or countable we increase it just a little bit more we need not worry focus on omega but if you have a sequence of random variables all of them are only taking finitely many or countably many each m xk or mk or whatever we talked about takes only countably many values or finitely many values everything we did all the things that we did calculations continue to hold with the same proofs now you may wonder why i didn't say it in the beginning well it was to tell you that while we are only everything is only a complete calculation involving a countable sequence of real numbers and here a little more technicality will be involved as we will see you don't need to go through any very general space so what i'm going to do is apply this to show how this can give you a proof of red on recording theorem on real line which by itself has nothing to do with probability uh, and then but of course you may say that sir we already have done red on recording theorem so what is the big deal in doing red on recording theorem using martingale techniques and you will get answer to that 
you get redon nicotine theorem and a bit lot bit more than what redon and nicotine had put in in their framework you'll get a lot more than that all right so uh, <clears throat> So uh, let uh, gamma now be the unit interval, and let B be the Borel sigma field or Borel sigma algebra. So probabilists call it sigma field, and uh, mathematicians who are not into probability will call it sigma algebra. But uh, just a collection of sets which is closed in the unions and intersections and countable unions, and has the null set there and closed closed under complements. that is the basic object on which measures are defined so nothing more than a measure we are going to use so no probability but just measure and the theorem is that suppose mu and nu are finite measures such that nu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu namely for all epsilon positive there is a delta such that a belonging to this uh, sigma field or sigma algebra and mu a less than delta implies sigma a less than epsilon so absolute continuity classic definition i don't know why i was writing something else and i had written this uh, this may be needed in the next step i will recouple come to that now let us do the following yeah so uh without loss of generality we can assume that uh, mu is 1 and mk means any function on gamma can be viewed as a random variable okay i did some rearrangement of uh, text and therefore this problem has occurred but i'll fix it in a minute okay so this is the framework you have a unit interval and you have measures on the borel field or borel algebra borel sigma algebra mu and nu first statement is that by because they are finite measures we can just uh, multiply by a constant and take mu of the entire space to be 1 once that happens any function can be thought of as a random any real valued function can be thought of as a random variable in particular now i am defining a sequence of functions so a, let's take this dyadic rationals for a fixed k you are dividing the interval uh, into 2 power k many parts sub intervals each sub interval i am calling it a sub k Can a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, dot dot dot. Okay, and then I define this function to be equal to this formula, and this is where I think that uh, remark that I had written. I think this uh, fit it on a thing. I rearrange the thing. So they are using the convention that a by b equals zero if b is zero. So in other words, if mu of a k is zero, I take the ratio to be zero, and so therefore it is defined for. Irrespective, even mu a k is zero, numerator is also zero. That is what our uh, absolute continuity will ensure. That if mu of a set is zero, mu of that set is also zero. So with that convention, this ratio will be defined to be zero. With that, these functions are well defined. So I have divided in the interview interval, and in each one, I am taking the uh, ratios of uh, mu uh, mu of that uh, interval divided uh, measure under mu divided by measure under mu. ratio and my function is defined on the entire interval at any point you take the interval to which that point belongs and you take this ratio on that point so my mk is now actually a finite value the mk takes only values uh, <coughs> real values but finitely many and uh, so nk can be viewed as a redon nicotine derivative of mu k with respect to mu k where mu k and mu k are restrictions of mu and nu to the finite algebra or field generated by this partition
yeah so uh, you divide it into two power k parts this gives you a partition of unit interval the algebra generated by this partition is what is my i can denote it by fk and restrict the measures mu and nu to these fks now they are finite uh, objects on that we are in the framework where we started this is the red on equidium derivative this is a function this is the random variable and for any subset b in this subset mu of b is expected value of mu indicator b where b is union of some sub collection because how do we take this expected value you will have to take b whichever ak it belongs so you have to multiply mk by that indicator take its measure that measure will be mu of that set and you multiply it by the ratio that will give you mu of that set and then you are adding over all the sets where this point x is there so that will give you mu of b so this is a trivial notationally complicated looks like but a trivial calculation that for this finitely many uh, finite value random variable that I, this random variable that i define on this finite uh, probability space involving two power k points okay uh, the uh, our definitions work and this is exactly the expected value of this random variable okay so my omega is not countable but my this random variable is actually defined on a finite it can be thought of as having been defined on a finite set this uh, finite partition okay and if you compare two of them at a time we can take the larger partition and both of them together can be seen as defined on that finite partition or finitely many if you take uh, first m1 m2 up to mn all of them can be thought of as uh, defined on a partition involving two power n points and therefore Uh, all the calculations which we did work for this framework so here is the observation the partition aj1 is a finer than ak1 ak2 ak2 2k per 1 you know if j is, yeah if j is less than k then this is finer and therefore ak is contained in aj every point here is a union of some finitely many values here and therefore uh we are in good shape and uh we can actually show this so that this mk is that we define now are actually a martingale so let's go to mk plus 1 from mk what would happen if you want to compare mk and mk plus 1 at any given point so you take up uh Point say here, okay. Then when you go to the k plus one partitions, what would happen? This interval that we have will get divided into two partitions. Next, our point will be either here or here. So this ratio will be then divided as as ratio of this two uh, ratio of mu over this interval and ratio of mu over that interval. But if you multiply them by mu of a k uh, mu of this part. and this one new of that part and take their sum it will be equal to uh, taking this ratio and multiplying by mu k of the whole interval so the rate <clears throat> matching will happen and again it's a fairly simple algebra to verify that this mk so defined satisfies the martingale property because each mk is taking only finitely many values uh one can verify point wise uh that uh it satisfies the martingale property and then one consequence will be i already observed that this uh mk can be thought of as a red on equidium derivative of mu with respect to mu on that finite space so as a concept we can take the sequence of observables uh you suitably it will just tell us which what is the index of that point etc and uh mu of mu k mk bigger than t is always is just expected value of under mu of this object this is a computation that our ratio that we define 
is working as a red on nicotine derivative on this finite uh, uh, finite on fields op uh, obtained by uh, finite partitions okay so the uh, while we are working with measures on uh, 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 <clears throat> unit interval and the borel sigma algebra and all that and all kinds of uh, things there but uh, tools we are using are only uh, at any given time we are only using finitely many objects at a time all that we have used earlier are is applicable and we will get that the <coughs> m case that we have defined is a martingale that is my observation while the underlying probability space is no longer a countable set each mk takes only finitely many values or it works on only a algebra of finitely many generated by finitely many sets and can be all the discussions regarding martingales as well as the inequality that we deduce continue to be true with the same proof as given earlier we don't have to rewrite any proof now we already saw that mk is a martingale and therefore using the computations that we did or the theorem we will get a estimate on the upcrossings number of times our upcrossings of this martingale mk which are red on nicotine derivatives on these partitions okay the upcrossings of those objects are bounded above by this now mns are non negative by our definition and expectation at any time is 1 we will get that this expected value is less than equal to 1 plus mod a divided by b minus a this calculation is using only our finite calculations that till uh, finite uh, object calculations that we have done till now up to time n Uh, M1, M2, Mn, all of them can be viewed as being defined on uh, uh, a set which is has only two power n entries, two power n entries, and on that we have defined all these objects. From there, we get this calculation. But now we interpret as something which has been defined. Uns upcrossings have been defined on the entire uh, unit interval for every n. Then. up crossing up to time n of this interval a to p is a increasing sequence and then therefore supremum or n un ab will be less than equal to e mu this says that the up crossings converge so dux up crossing inequality tells us that the up crossings obtained via this red on nicotine derivatives obtained on this finite partitions converge point wise and for those who work with analysis and proving this often you want to prove a certain thing converges to something else major chunk of work goes in proving that that object converges and then a little bit more to show that the limiting object is exactly what you have claimed to be often the major part of work is is in proving convergence which we have already have done and now uh, using a few simple things we can show that uh, the convergence is actually uh, to the required object so this is another fact from measure theory uh, which is not stressed much in analysis courses when they do just the minimal measure theory but is stressed a lot in probability theory sessions which is the following is a notion of uniform integrability of a sequence of uh, uh, functions i have written here in terms of expected value but equivalently the same i can write in terms of uh, integral with respect to b nu forget expectation it could be integral mod fn indicator fn bigger than m k b mu mu is some uh, fun, uh, uh, measure okay so this function is said to be uniformly integrable with respect to this sequence if you take integral over the set that 
function bigger than k integrability says that this will go to zero as k goes to infinity uniform integrable means you take supremum over n and it still goes to zero and the fact is that fn converges almost everywhere to f if and only if uh, this converges to zero so sorry in general convergence almost everywhere doesn't tell you anything about convergence in l1 you can have examples where all objects are L1, Fn converges to F uniform uh, almost everywhere, but uh, it doesn't converge in L1. Uh, the uniform integrability is the gap. If you have uniform con almost everywhere convergence and uniform integrability, together you get, get L1 convergence. Typically, we do this in uh, <clears throat> dominated convergence theorem. So, if you have uh, Fn's are uniform are dominated, then they are uniformly integrable, but that's only a sufficient condition. Uh, here is a lot more. Okay. This is uh, there in analysis books, but not stressed in analysis course. Not all books, but several books it will be there. Or uniform integrability. All probability books is there. Alright. So here we can verify uniform integrability by using uh, another tool done by do so using martingale techniques uh, we can sh check that this mn indicator mn bigger than k is equal to the integral under nu of indicator mn bigger than k which is the measure of mn bigger than k and then absolute continuity uh, argument the epsilon delta definition of absolute absolute continuity is going to give us that we uh, can epsilon given epsilon get a delta such that measure less than delta implies new measure is less than epsilon and now for any k bigger than 1 by delta mu of mn bigger than k is less than 1 by k this which is less than delta from there we will get that mu is less than epsilon and therefore we will get that mu of mn bigger than k is less than epsilon so this required expectation less than epsilon so absolute continuity gives us that our mn's that we constructed so let's come back to mn's this mn's so if mu is absolutely continuous with respect to mu first of all that this is well defined that denominator is zero then the numerator is also zero and secondly with respect to mu as a measure space these functions are uniformly integrable both these are simple facts which come from measure theory calculations and almost everywhere convergence comes from loops uh, techniques and results and together they give us that fn converges to f in l1 moreover uh, uh, the convergence in l1 means we had already checked that uh, this new b is this for every j bigger than k so l1 convergence will give us that mu of b is equal to expectation mu m star indicator b for every b in fk so as long as b is an interval coming out of uh, is a un finite union of uh, dyadic rationals of uh, index k this is true for any k so as long as it's an interval of any dyadic rationals uh, mu of b is equal to expectation mu m star indicator b then again recourse to measure theory standard mumbo jumbo will give us that mu b equal to indicator uh, mu this equation continues to hold over the entire uh, set, subset b, entire sets b in the sigma field and therefore it's a uh non equivalent derivative okay so coming back technically the whole thing was to just construct just take these dyadic rationals and uh, take the uh, uh, non equivalent derivative of this finite uh, field or finite algebra of sets uh, and that can be defined trivially and then we have that this martingale techniques are telling us that these objects converge in l1 and almost surely to a vector to, to a function and that function is the radon nicodium derivative or is a version of radon nicodium derivative now uh, so yet another proof is fine but what is the advantage so
being measurable your voice is breaking what of is a measurable family of measured and my voice is breaking so maybe some problem with my internet maybe is it better now yeah it's better now but yeah it's uh, it. last two minutes it was kind of was not audible okay the next the distance had gone more i'll tell hold it closer to my voice okay so uh, if coming back for a few minutes if it may be lost a family of uh, measures nu s indexed by uh, s in say 01 and such that s going to nu a is measurable for every interval a or for every borel set a okay uh, then the major, the martingale proof given above shows that the redon nicodem derivative m star s can be chosen such that sx going to m star sx is jointly measurable this will be true because our uh, m, m star sk if i call it uh the kth object mks the kth object that we define will be measurable and then we have constructed explicitly the limiting objects so they will be measurable and so this you will get that the redon nicodem derivative on one hand for every s it's a redon nicodem derivative and as a function of s and x it is jointly measurable such techniques or such things become important even in something like harmonic analysis and uh When you may have index of measures, and you want to do jointly measurable redon nicodem derivative, will solve the problem. Uh, so this is where the power is coming. By any other proof that you may have seen, joint measurability will be very difficult to get. I can't say that you cannot get, but it will be very difficult to get. Not so easy. Whereas here, uh, primarily tools that we have used are the three primary tools of do that we used and then standard measure theory you can't exit measure theory because our final result is measure theory but only that much no additional stuff is needed then is the standard measure theory additional stuff needed only were notion of martingale stopping times martingale transform uh, maximal inequality and up crossings inequality which we did uh, i don't say i wrote out proofs completely but you can check books and that is easy to do proofs it can be uh, even a project for master students write down in the finite case write down proofs of all these things okay uh, more interestingly is that essentially the same techniques can be used to get the very general version from martingales when you move away from finite objects to general martingales Namely, defined on arbitrary measure spaces. We are not putting only finite omega. Uh, the techniques for these three results are essentially the same. And uh, of course, many tools, many books are will have it, but you may have to do a lot of background to reach that chapter where these things will be done. Uh, so one way is the one way to do it is because this is in chapter one of uh, my book with Professor Bivi Rao. Uh, introduction to stochastic calculus this was in 2018 there is also an indian edition there also online editions are there and uh, you can trace and you can get hold of online uh, thing i'm sure all uh, you can you know how to get online things from the internet so you can um, but the, it's there also on uh, hindustan book publication so it may be uh, uh, already in some various libraries also wherever they get the nbhm books from uh, hindustan book so this is part of the hindustan book series also a springer series and uh, this is all in chapter 1 so you don't need much background to even do uh, these three theorems in the more general case okay. so any question about redon nicodem i can talk now otherwise i have one small application also that is a probability theory application so i first did it which is a application going beyond probability any question about this yes. 
so if not let us uh, let me go to the second application that i had written out so once again we are talking on the open unit interval uh, open close so close at zero open at one unit interval and let skx be the kth digit in the dyadic expansion of x so uh, uh, you, you you just store x as as is done in our computer systems as a uh, in the dyadic exam expansions so you take skx be the dyadic expansion of a integer okay of not an integer of a real number between 0 and 1 now intuitively it is clear that if you know the first k digit doesn't tell you anything about what the k plus first digit will be again because first k digit will tell you which interval you have gone at one point but beyond that you don't know any more next one will be one or zero would depend on whether it is the first half or the second half of the uh, interval where you have reached okay so therefore uh, if you are looking at uniform probability allocation to the unit interval then the next digit will be zero and one with equal probability so if you define uk to be uh, instead of 1 and 0 i want to convert it to 1 and minus 1 so if uh, 1 remains 1 but 0 becomes minus 1 so you take 2 times sk minus 1 now you will get that uk is, will be each uh, we already talked about independence and then we have uh, each of them is 0 and uh, 1 with probability half half so uk will be 1 and minus 1 with probability half half so this becomes a sequence of iid uh, random variables and uh, each with probability uh, expectation will be zero so this is called random walk and there are many thing writings in probability books called drunkard's random drunkard's walk or random walk so the description is there is a person who is dead drunk he doesn't know what he is doing so he tosses a coin if it's head he goes plus one if it is tail he goes minus one and then you are analyzing what happens to him eventually so what is the partial for this to be your voice is breaking again your voice is breaking again okay uh, does it improve right now it's good yeah so i think it may not be the distance but it's just the exact location between the my ipad and my uh, uh, voice okay all right when you started drunkard walk after that you start breaking it would appear as if i am myself drunk <laughs> <laughs> okay so this sk is also called drunkard's walk in other words a drunkard person who doesn't know what is happening he tosses a coin if it is head he goes plus one if, if it is minus tail he goes minus one and uh, so sk is the net location where he would be at the time k okay. or random walk you are just walking randomly you don't know where you are going you, uh, head you go plus one tail you go minus one and you are where you reach okay sometimes also called symmetric random walk uh, very popular in from here one can get to all kinds of very interesting examples from starting with random walk so question what is the long term behavior of the random walk can it happen that let's say this fellow or drunkard man or the random walk will keep fluctuating between let's say plus thousand and minus thousand and will never cross that boundary with or uh, fix the integer a and let p a be the probability that sk will be equal to a for some k bigger than equal to one question is p a equal to one so you go far away somewhere a billion what is the probability that at some point you will reach one billion is this probability one more precisely let's fix one negative number and one positive number and let qa be the probability that you hit a before you hit minus b what is this qab so uh, as you are talking about any finance application or any gambling application nobody has infinite money in their pocket you assume that whatever it is it is some finite number so 
how will, will you reach A before you hit your uh, negative value at which you will be thrown out of the system? So, so we think about B as a uh, if you reach B, you are going to be thrown out, so you will never reach A. And what is the probability that you will reach A before you hit B? Negative B. Okay. What is that probability? So, uh, and now if you know QAB from there, we can make a judgment about what this PA will be. And what if we get the PA is one always, then we have got the long term behavior of the random walk. So, just by posing these three questions, we realize that the QAB, computation of QAB is an important aspect. Once you get hold of that, uh, uh, you are game. You can do other things. Okay? And computation of QAB, likewise, now you can reduce it to computations with respect to martingales of finite objects. So, this we already talked about UKs being IID that are being independent. So the expectation of UK plus 1 given U1, U2, UK is 0. And hence, SK, which is the partial sums, also satisfies that expected value of SK plus 1 given the first K objects. The total first K objects you already know. The new object you have added as mean 0. So the total as mean 0. Therefore, you are where you were previous time. So this is a martingale. So trivially, the random walk is a martingale, which means 0. Important calculation is squares. So now you take expected value of S square K plus 1. Now S square K plus 1 can be written as S square K plus 2 S K U K plus 1 plus U K plus 1 square. And S K square expected value given conditional because you all it's a function of U and U to U K it will be S K square. Uh, expected value of this term will be 0 because S K will be a constant once you are given the back, uh, entire thing up to time K and expectation of UK plus 1 given the background history will be 0. So, expected value of this will be 0. Conditional expectation of this will be 0. And conditional expectation of this, this is independent of U and U to UK. So, this will be same as expectation of U square, which will, U square is always 1 in any case. No need to do any expectations. You are either plus 1 or minus 1. So, it is 1 always. U square is always 1. So, you get S square K plus 1. Therefore, if you define ZK to be S square K minus N, we will see that ZK becomes a martingale. So by some simple transformations out of our original system, we have got hold of two sequence of martingales, SK and ZK. Okay. Locations and uh, the square of the location in minus N, the time taken. So now let us fix a minus b less than 0 less than a and let tau a minus b be the first time you hit either a or a minus b. And our aim will be whether when you hit, whether you hit at a or whether you hit at b. Right? So where we use the con uh, convention that infimum over an infinite set is 0. And let's see when will this be equal to infinity? If your SK uh, never hits A or minus B, it stays inside the, in it is not in minus B and it is not in A, but it is only in the uh, interval between that. So I didn't write it correctly. Maybe either I should write it as an interval minus B to A, or if I write it as a set, then I have to write at minus B plus 1 to A minus 1. So I need to correct this. I will. All right. So, uh, now this is a stop time and if you take S at tau A minus B minimum N, that means you don't go beyond N if you have not stopped before N. If you are only looking at S1, S2, Sn, you define this uh, stopping time to be this minimum N, that's a stop time and the, this will be always in any case less than or equal to maximum of A and B. Since SK and ZN are martingales and these are bounded stop times, it will follow that SK minimum tau AB and SK minimum tau AB, A minimum minus B are martingales with mean 0. Now, upcrossings inequality will tell us 
that SK converges almost surely and uh, SK converging almost surely says that SK will be equal to SK plus 1. Uh, that will tell us that you have to be either at A or minus B because anywhere in between next step you can never be same. You will be either plus 1 or minus 1. So that means almost surely you would have hit A or B. So this is uh, the upcrossing inequality will tell us that you will be hitting A or B with probability 1. Uh, and then this is a simple algebra calculation and mean 0 will tell us that actually the probability of hitting the upper bound is B by A plus B and probability of hitting the lower bound are, is A by A plus B. And a little bit with square there, you can go over this calculation later, but it will tell us that the expected value is A, A times B. The time taken to hit A or minus B expected value is AB. So, from here we get this important conclusions that you are anyway going to hit A, but to, uh, to get to that we will have to take limit as B goes to minus infinity and then your expectation of this will be infinity. So, a drunkard will surely hit any point you want, but the expected value of time taken to hit that point is going to be infinity. You can't put an upper bound on how long it will take to reach that point. Expected value will be infinity. So, these are uh, hurried over maybe because of the time limits, but it is written out here. I will clean it up and also put it up uh, in two or three days. I will send the cleaned up version to Archana who will put it in the appropriate location. But we have answers to these three questions and the answer is long term behavior is you, you fix any point, eventually you will hit that point, but the time you will, which may elapse before you hit that time may be infinitely large. Expected value can be huge, it be infinity. Now PA is 1, QAB we computed, but long time behavior we answer. And all this, apart from some simple mathematical uh, tools, only probabilistic computations we needed came from the three basic tools of loop which we covered today. Maximal inequality, uh, 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 upcrossing inequality and uh, 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 the tra uh, martingale transforms, these three tools. So, let me stop here.